This is videotape number one at the home of John Walkley. The date is July the 15th, 1977. place to start is I was born at, you know, yeah. in. Yeah. So are you that tell me to start or are you, uh... Well, Jim, 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 okay, yeah. we in our case. So uh, tell us about where you were born and when. Uh-huh. Well, I was uh, born in a suburb of Cincinnati, Hartwell, Ohio, out where they make ivory soap, uh, very close to that. And uh, my father at that time was a principal of a high school. He also taught woodworking and shop practice and things of that sort. But uh, sometime, which I don't remember, we moved into the center of Cincinnati and lived in Mount Auburn, which um, was close, fairly close to the University of Cincinnati. And my father worked for the, his PhD there. Uh, he had uh, gotten his original bachelor's degree from uh, Ohio State, of Columbus, and this um, this effort he had of getting a PhD, of course, uh, I have no appreciation of. I was too young, uh, but what it led to apparently was that he uh, specialized in uh, a field which was really the hot field of the day: uh, ionized gases, what happens in Crookes tubes and things of that sort, and uh, so. Uh, uh, as a result of his uh, thesis work on that, apparently he was picked by uh, another man who'd uh, come from the University of Cincinnati, uh, Dr. Bauer, and who was then head of the uh, Department of Terrestrial Magnetism of the Carnegie Institution. What a mouthful. Uh, <laughs> uh, that institution department was in Washington, D.C., and uh, so he was uh, hired to be a, a worker in the research on atmospheric electricity. Uh, he worked under a man named uh, W.F.G. Swan, uh, who uh, later came to Philadelphia and uh, uh, worked at uh, Bartol Foundation as the director of that. Well, at any rate, this uh, life in Cincinnati uh, was then cut short uh, by moving to um, Washington. And just before that, why, I had a, one sister. I, that, that's all I have in the way of brothers and sisters is uh, seven years my junior, uh, my sister Betty. And uh, as a result of all of this, why, um, we took our residence in uh, Washington uh, after my father had already started working on the job. Uh, just the other day somebody sent me a postcard which my uh, father had sent to us while we were uh, waiting to come to Washington. And uh, it described what the, uh, it showed a picture of what the uh, place was like uh, where he worked. Uh, the, a research lab high on a hill in the middle of Rock Creek Park. Very isolated. That's because for atmospheric work they also wanted to do geomet uh, magnetic work as studying the Earth's magnetism was their main job. And uh, no one in the United States was doing much of that kind of work. That's why the Carnegie Institution set up such a department. Well, I think that the first school I uh, went to in Washington was about the third grade, right there in Chevy Chase, uh, at the Elizabeth V. Brown School. That school no longer is in operation. Uh, but uh, uh, I had previously had a wonderful opportunity which uh, got lost in that in Cincinnati, we had half a day school in German and half a day school in English, and I have among some old uh, things around uh, spelling papers in which I wrote in German script, which I can't read now. But the uh, general idea was that uh, uh, if I had stayed in that environment, 
why well, I, uh, I would, like uh, a lot of other people in Cincinnati then, been just about as proficient in German as I was in English. And uh, unfortunately, why well, uh, my ability in German has never been uh, developed further, and uh, I can't really say I'm fluent there. At any rate, in Washington, why well, uh, it was a rather interesting environment, I thought, in that uh, my family, uh, as soon as they could, bought a house in Chevy Chase, Maryland, which was a rather remote suburb, but still it was served in a sort of way by a streetcar line, which uh, ran all the way out to what was called Chevy Chase Lake. I don't think that lake exists anymore either. But at the end of Connecticut Avenue, which Washingtonians will re readily recognize, uh, the streetcar line found its terminus in Chevy Chase Lake. And uh, way out in Maryland, on the way to that uh, Chevy Chase Lake, uh, was a place called Bradley Lane and uh, uh, a country club uh, called Chevy Chase Country Club where they played uh, Davis tennis matches and things like that. But we lived in a, a rather remote uh, end of Bradley Lane in a frame house which uh, gave us plenty of uh, advantages to uh, do what we wanted. Uh, gave me uh, the opportunity in uh, the years when I learned how to uh, wire up the house and put uh, uh, telephone connections in, which the telephone company objected to and had to take out again, um, and other kinds of sort more or less automatic warning devices. If somebody was coming upstairs, it would turn out the lights in my room. So if they think I'd gone to bed when I really hadn't. I was reading detective stories. And uh, that sort of thing went on, as I say, at an early age. I had uh, buried uh, lines when they finally put uh, the water system in. Originally we worked with well water and uh, they, when they installed the water system, why, I took advantage of the ditches they dug to uh, drop wires into the ditch before they filled them in and had uh, underground wires to some of my uh, neighbors' houses to do a little bit of uh, telegraph and uh, trying to do telephone. My telephones weren't very good. I didn't know how to make a carbon button microphone. But uh, in those days, why well, uh, telegraph was uh, more or less what uh, boys used if they wanted to fool around with uh, communicating by electricity. And so those things uh, were part of my uh, childhood experiences, I guess you'd say now, that uh, uh, one of the things I remember, for instance, in those days, we. Uh, set off firecrackers on 4th of July. They, uh, you could buy them in Maryland, though you couldn't, they were outlawed in the District of Columbia. So we were living in Maryland and we would buy firecrackers, but I was going to be safe. So I used my hobbies to be safe. I got a Ford spark coil and I ignited all these firecrackers uh, by a spark. And I was nowhere near, and I was in no danger of having my fingers blown off and I thought that was great to have a remote control which would <laughs> set off a firecracker. And uh, there were more and more things. I actually made a pipe bomb which I uh, set off uh, that way, but uh, in a remote way so that uh, it wasn't going to endanger me or anyone else. They, uh, okay, can we stop there for a minute? Sure. All right, good. So you might start. Why don't we just start? You might start by saying your, my father's name was, and and uh, yes. tell us a little bit about a little more okay. detail about him. And my mother's name was, and tell me a little bit more about yes. her and your memories of her. Well, okay. the other thing you might mention okay. is that her father and her aunts were German-speaking people. Yes, I yeah. might. Yes. Well, there's a lot of things I might mention. The question is, we got to get it down <laughs> somehow. You know, yeah. can't do everything. So, if you want that. Why well, we're trying to put more of that in. Yeah. So mm -hmm. whenever you're ready to roll, let's just say. Oh. Oh. Well, my father was named Sebastian Jacob Mockley. Uh, 
that's quite a name considering the ones that you hear nowadays and uh, he came from a German speaking family uh, farmers I think his brother was a farmer one of his brothers uh, Henry I think became a farmer and uh, uh, he had uh, one sister who Rachel Mockley who uh, was really a career woman she became uh, the operator and the accountant and everything for a uh, feed and lumber company in Swanton, Ohio, where he was born. Well, he went to Ohio State University and uh, got his bachelor's degree. And uh, I don't know much about just how he got where uh, he did next, but uh, he was a, uh, when I was born, he was a principal of a high school in Swanton, Ohio. That's a suburb of Cincinnati near where they make ivory soap. And uh, as such, he also taught shop work, uh, how to do woodworking and uh, machine work of various sorts. But he had uh, the ambition to go further. And so the next thing I know was that uh, we moved, that is my mother and he and I, and that was all there was in the family then, moved to the center of Cincinnati, uh, near the University of Cincinnati. Uh, just where he uh, met my mother, I don't know that either, but she was a grade school teacher uh, and uh, retired from that occupation when uh, she got married. And as far as I know, she did a fairly good job of raising me then and decided that uh, they would have Another child, a sister Betty, born seven years younger than I, uh, while we were in Cincinnati. But at the conclusion of uh, my father's degree work in physics at the University of Cincinnati, he got a job in Washington. Apparently the reason he got that job was because he'd gone into a rather hot new topic in physics, uh, the subject of ionized discharges in gases and Crookes tubes and things of that sort, and he did some research on that. I don't think I've ever read his doctor's thesis, but as a result of his research on ionized gases, electrified gases, why well, he was hired uh, to work at the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism and Atmospheric Electricity. What a mouthful. <laughs> and that was in Washington, D.C., where they studied not only uh, what makes the Earth magnetic and what accounts for the variations of the compass, but also they studied atmospheric electric phenomenon, the current through the atmosphere, which most people are unaware of, and lightning and other things which we're very much aware of, those things were studied to see whether they had any connection with the magnetism of the Earth, because electricity and magnetism, by this time in the world's history, of course, were well known to be related. And so, how can we explain the Earth's magnetism unless we somehow find some connections? They studied Earth currents, too, and uh, all kinds of things which might help to determine why the Earth had a magnetic field and why the compass was always changing and you had to make new maps for navigation purposes every 10 years or so just to be sure that the compass was better than uh, some uh, just guesswork in navigation. They didn't have gyro compasses then, you know. So we moved to Cincinnati and uh, that was, uh, in a way, a sort of a, uh, a deprivation, you might say. I didn't realize it then, but I've always wished that I knew more German than I do. So I'll tell you, my mother and my father both came from German-speaking families. My mother's name was Scheidemantel, then more German what could be. And uh, so she and her two sisters uh, married people uh, who did not speak German, and, and as far as I know, I, uh, the German language dropped out of our family as far as usage is concerned. And it also dropped out of my schooling uh, 
which had uh, been in Cincinnati half a day of German and half a day of English. That's the way the Cincinnati school system then worked. But when we moved to Washington, why I was in the third grade and it was all English. But there were other advantages, of course, by moving to Washington, which uh, I didn't realize then uh, how important they were going to be to me. Uh, one of the advantages was that when we bought a house in Chevy Chase, Maryland, that uh, we were among a real community of scientists. There were lots of people in that area who worked at the National Bureau of Standards, which was in Cleveland Park, about halfway out to Chevy Chase Circle, which was the district line. And we were a mile further out in Maryland, where uh, I walked to school for a mile while I was going to the um, local elementary school. And then when it came time to go to high school, why I walked practically that mile to get to the streetcar line to take the Chevy Chase streetcar right down into the center of Washington, where on uh, Rhode Island Avenue around 7th Street was the McKinley Technical High School where one could uh, learn all kinds of uh, physics and other s subjects which were better taught there, we thought, than uh, at any other high school. This was the one technical high school of the city. And uh, it was a co-educational high school, too. There were lots of girls there, as well as boys, learning other subjects uh, which fit in with the technical atmosphere. The um, I graduated from the Tech High after four years of that, and uh, then I had the problem, of course, where am I going to school? Well, of course I was going to the University of Cincinnati, not just because my father had got his big degree there, the PhD, but because in the course of his doing his work there, he knew Her Dean Herman Schneider well, and they had started what they called a cooperative plan, where half of the time you'd go to work and half the time you'd be in the school, in your classroom. Such plans have been adopted other places, as just Drexel Institute and Drexel University now. Uh, and it's a, a nice way to uh, keep in touch with reality and also keep the pocketbook filled. And that was my reason, really. If I were going to go to a school, to college, on my father's income, the only plan I had was to go to this cooperative engineering school where I could earn as I learned. And that was my plan, except it got changed by an English teacher. At the um, university, I mean at the uh, McKinley Technical High, uh, one of the uh, teachers had a brother who had gotten a scholarship to Hopkins Engineering. And of course, that was a surprise to me, as it is to many people, that Hopkins was not just a medical school, but an engineering school. And this was a rather recent development, that is, that the state had set up this engineering school, thinking that it was about time that uh, Maryland had something. Later on, of course, the University of Maryland was given lots of state money to do a lot of engineering and other work. At that time, why the place to go then in Maryland for an engineering education was uh, Johns Hopkins School of Engineering. And I entered there having won a senatorial scholarship on the basis of competition tests and things. And uh, that was in 1925. And uh, I was happy for two years studying that engineering and uh, learning the the basic things, taking the basic courses. But I be became more and more unhappy for several reasons. One of them was that uh, there were other people at Hopkins who were taking advanced degrees and who worked with my father back at uh, Trust of Magnetism or worked at the Bureau of Standards nearby where I knew a lot of people. And. Uh, it seemed to me that uh, those people taking degrees in physics were uh, 
uh, going in a direction which is more fun than anything I saw in the engineering. The engineering was, to use a common phrase, seemed to be cookbook stuff that uh, you just looked up something and you found out that if you were designing a structure that uh, was supposed to bear a certain load, then you use this cross-section of uh, steel and you put this many rivets in it to hold it together and so on. And we used the handbook put out by the steel companies. And so there, it was their cookbook. And uh, we designed the steel the way the U.S. Steel Company and such uh, told us how. So although some of the courses uh, were very interesting, uh, like uh, some new ideas about drafting, and how to do projections and uh, perspectives and so on by uh, strict uh, mechanical drafting methods. Why, well, all in all, I felt from the friendships I had and the kinds of courses I saw that physics was going to be the interesting way to go. Those are the boys that were going to have the fun. And after all, my father was a physicist. I didn't know much about his work, but I'd been down in his uh, underground uh, laboratories back there in Rock Creek Park uh, in the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism. Why, uh, sometimes I go down within what they call a constant temperature laboratory uh, and we would measure earth currents or some other thing uh, in a place where everything was supposedly at about the same temperature all the time because the room was deep in the earth and we weren't trying to evade bombs in those days. We were just trying to evade uh, fluctuations in temperature. But there was another fluctuation, incidentally, which uh, came along at that time, which uh, uh, was sort of interesting. Those same streetcars which ran out to Chevy Chase Lake and which I used going back and forth to high school uh, ran with a single wire trolley and all the current that came to that trolley to run the streetcar ran back through the ground or the rails. Well, the rails weren't welded as nicely as they could be. So at every joint in the rails, the electricity would leak out of the tracks and into the earth. That didn't worry the trolley company at all, as long as the electricity got back to the generating station. But it worried us here a mile away from the streetcar line in Rock Creek Park there were fluctuations in the earth currents, which my father was measuring and I was helping him with, which were caused by the occasional passage of a streetcar. So they made an arrangement, incidentally, with the Capital Traction Company, which ran those cars, to substitute buses at night, the owl bus system. Once an hour, a bus would go out to Chevy Chase, and streetcars didn't run until the next day. And that helped the cause of science as far as earth currents is concerned. Well, I helped him in various things down there and I got to know some of the people there. And that's how, for instance, that I knew that some of them were over at Hopkins studying for advanced degrees when I got over there. And uh, after that, why well, uh, the question was, if I weren't going to be an engineer, what can I do to change over? And turned out that was simple, that the Hopkins people had been worrying about a question which other educators have worried about many times. Uh, I think that uh, Hutchins out at the University of Chicago worried about this too, and that is, uh, what can you do to give people a degree and credits and things just because they've studied and learned something and not because they've uh, accomplished a certain number of hours in the classroom and so forth. Well, Hopkins had then what was called a Goodenough plan. Uh, this fellow, Dr. Goodenough, had become president of Hopkins and he established this plan known by his name whereby you need not get a bachelor's degree before you started out to get a master's degree or you need not get a master's degree if you wanted to go right through and get a Doctor of Philosophy, a PhD. And it turned out it was just possible at that time for me to switch to the graduate school after only two years of engineering. And I switched over, and lo and behold, I became a teacher. <laughs> <laughs>
I was allowed to serve in the, the physics laboratories uh, where the undergraduate students were taking the same laboratory course that I'd taken the year before. And uh, I was what they called a student assistant. And I got some pay for that. That helped. And uh, some of the other helps I had in the way of further scholarships. I lost my engineering scholarship by switching, but I picked up another thing called a Quincy scholarship, which was for physics students. And in the result of all that was that I was able to carry on my studies in the graduate school, despite the fact that in uh, 1928 my father died. And uh, so I was essentially on my own from that point on. But by doing this teaching in graduate school and uh, working at the National Bureau of Standards where I'd had friends and still had friends, why well, uh, I was able to get along. So I did work for uh, Dr. Briggs, who became a director of the Bureau of Standards uh, for a while. And I worked, uh, one of my pleasant times was to work in the wind tunnel, which was run by a fellow named Hugh Dryden. Dr. Dryden, who has uh, since died, uh, became the head of the NASA, the National Aeronautic and Space Administration. And uh, so, uh, I got a, uh, a lot of experience in various things, including wind tunnels, going up to like uh, 75 miles an hour uh, with a big propeller uh, driven by a big electric motor and so on. So that was part of the experience. And then, of course, later, uh, not only the teaching experience uh, was helpful to me, but also the fact that I was able to get a... Uh, uh, a chance to work with uh, some of the professors in spectroscopy and to choose finally to do a thesis in spectroscopy. I took my doctor's degree in a very uh, bold way, you might say, in that there was a new professor on campus just come in from a Japanese res uh, a visit where he was a National Research Fellow in Japan professor of band spectroscopy, the spectroscopy of the molecules. Before that, you know, everybody had been working on what kinds of light it was given out by atoms, and they were analyzing the, all this business by a new thing called quantum theory, which was developing during my time. And uh, so we had to learn things which I never dreamed of when I first started in physics. All this business about quantum theory, with all the textbooks written in German at that time. Well, fortunately, I did have a little bit of a hanky, a little bit of a penchant, you might say, for understanding uh, German, even though I didn't speak it fluently. And so, with uh, that kind of a help, I, I could read some of these books then published in Germany about. Uh, Heisenberg's new quantum theory and things of that sort. And I just decided there's the exciting field of physics. There's something new where you can do two things which I couldn't choose between. One was I liked experimental work. I liked to put things together and see them work. And uh, after all, with my mechano set in my basement of my house, I'd uh, not only built in automatic alarms and other things. I'd uh, built a, uh, a model elevator which would go up and down just because I moved a lever to the right or the left. And uh, that operated the brakes as well and so forth. And that uh, pleased me at the age I was then. Here now I was saying, I want to do experimental physics. But on the other hand, I want to learn some theory too. So let's pick a subject where you have to do both. And apparently, while everybody else was picking purely experimental stuff or purely theoretical things, why, well, uh, here I was the uh, guy who decided I didn't know when I was well off, I had to do both. And uh, so I worried about how to do glass blowing. Go over and watch the chemistry department's glass blower. Uh, draw out tubes and uh, weld uh, 
fasten the faces of the tubes so that you had a nice clear window for the spectrum of a light to come out uh, and uh, all kinds of things putting photographic plates into a um, 21 foot grating they call it that's a large room in which there is a ruled glass surface which uh, sends the light which falls upon it off in different directions depending on its wavelength and this kind of diffraction grating had become the best way of making a an analysis of a spectrum and I was trying to get the spectrum of what? Carbon monoxide. Not because I was interested in its possible lethal properties but merely because someone else over in England had analyzed that spectrum already and they'd come to what seemed to be the wrong conclusions. And uh, so Professor Dika, who was this new man on campus, set me to work on getting that spectrum and analyzing it. And over the next few years of my graduate work, I did exactly that, with his help, of course. And uh, the result was such a complicated thing that uh, after the thesis was accepted by the, uh, it was published in Physical Review uh, yeah, under the joint authorship of Professor Dika and myself. And that brings us up to about 1932-33. We, we'll take a break right there. I think that's good. So, are we... So, are we ready? Yes, we're ready. Okay, go ahead. Well, as some of you may remember, why, well, of course, 1932 and 33 was a period in the life of this country called a depression. And it wasn't something that was just over in a half a year or more. In fact, I got my PhD in 1932, and I couldn't just walk out and find a job right away. So I took an assistantship type of thing, a research assistant to Dr. Dika for a year, in which I did more laboratory work and lots of calculations on these spectra of molecules and things of that sort. And then I was fortunate enough to uh, be asked if I would take a job teaching physics in a Pennsylvania college known as Ursinus College. Well, at the time, I'd never heard of Ursinus before, and I wasn't uh, sure why they were coming to Hopkins to get somebody, but it turned out that they uh, liked PhDs from Hopkins, and. Uh, They'd had one as a teacher there, and now they decided that I'd be the next. If I were uh, satisfactory, and I went up for an interview and uh, found out that uh, everything was uh, agreeable. They decided they would offer me the job, and I decided I would take the job at something like uh, $2,400 a year. Of course, we didn't find out till later that uh, the uh, college was uh, suffering from the Depression, and all of the faculty decided to keep the college going by giving back 10% of their salary. So I didn't really get $2,400 a year. <laughs> and uh, But by that time, uh, things were settled. I went to Collegeville, Pennsylvania, where Sinus College uh, was and still is, and uh, took the job as being the head of the physics department. And I was it. There wasn't any other. And I had a one course in physics to teach because they had pre-medical students who had to have a science course in physics. As the years went by, why well, uh, we uh, developed a, a number of courses for physics and uh, got uh, advanced courses uh, in the catalog, uh, and I had a number of very interesting students uh, to teach, and uh, I was very pleased with this, very interested in it. But as with anybody trained as I was, and with a father 
in scientific pursuits and so on. Why, well, I thought that uh, part of my life should be devoted to research. Teaching was interesting, teaching was wonderful, but in addition to making some more research scientists as well as teachers, uh, I had a curiosity and a sort of a, a will to go ahead and pursue these uh, subjects of how do you apply physics to uh, things like what makes the atmospheric electricity uh, go and what makes thunderstorms and all the things my father was interested in. But I had this other thing that uh, here were all these uh, molecules which were only beginning to be understood by people who were studying the spectrum. Well, what do you do in a case like that? You have to consider the realities of the fact that uh, this was a small liberal arts college. They didn't have a big budget for research and they hardly had new enough and good enough equipment just to teach the first year physics students. So any budget there was for the physics department to buy equipment had to be spent on improving the teaching uh, apparatus and so on. So what could I do research on? I certainly couldn't do research as I was doing at Hopkins with a 21-foot concave grating and a lot of other paraphernalia which cost a great deal of money. That of course is a great deal of money as uh, people in those days saw it. Today, why well, of course a big uh, nuclear power, uh, nuclear uh, experimental apparatus, uh, a large uh, cyclotron or something, uh, ha is such money as uh, you couldn't uh, possibly compare with a little room with one grating in it. But at any rate, with that kind of situation, I had no way in to, to continue the experimental work that I was doing on uh, the molecules and their spectra. But I did have a very interesting uh, introduction to the calculation of the energy levels, which is an important part of the understanding how a molecule is put together, so to speak, and uh, how it would interact with things. And uh, what this is very closely related to chemistry. And so the chemists and the physicists were getting closer to each other and explaining the facts of chemistry through the laws of physics, just by these quantum mechanics kinds of analyses of spectra. And I had developed a method of computing these energy levels while I was working in the 1932-33 period. Uh, and uh, I thought, well, all I need is a little computing machine. Well, this depression was a, a sort of a godsend from my point of view then because it turned out that there were banks going broke. That didn't help other people much, but it enabled me for $75 to buy a second-hand desk calculating machine which could multiply and divide as well as add and subtract. And with that, it turned out that it was exactly the same kind of machine as I'd used at Hopkins in their physics department to do these calculations. So I had exactly what I wanted to continue calculating these levels for molecular energies. The only trouble was that after I'd gotten that, which I had to pay for out of my own pocket, I couldn't get the school budget to do that, but I managed $75 for that. The trouble was that soon as I began to uh, investigate the friends and colleagues that I might have in the Philadelphia area, I found there was a man at the University of Pennsylvania that was doing the same thing. Well, that's no good, of course. Uh, you don't, in research, do exactly the same thing and expect to uh, get there uh, and take all the credit especially if he's got more resources than you have, and he did have. He had an assistant that got paid full-time all the time to do these calculations, whereas I was merely making such calculations as I could during my spare time when I wasn't teaching.
So that was a pretty serious reason for trying something else. Uh, I was further discouraged uh, almost so uh, soon by the fact that another person, Gilbert King, at uh, Arthur D. Little Company, uh, published some work which showed that he was using punch card equipment, big stuff that usually is used for commercial accounting work, and here he was with punch card equipment aiding him, and I don't know how big a staff, computing these same energy levels of these same molecular problems, and uh, he was far outclassing me then in his resources for computation there. Well, with my uh, penchant for uh, the kind of work my father had been doing, and my friendship with people both at the Bureau of Standards and at the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism, which was nearby in Rock Creek Park, as I said, uh, I thought, well, I've got access to data in the uh, geophysical area, data on atmospheric electricity and things of that sort, uh, where maybe some of my uh, calculating efforts can help to reduce the data and make some scientific conclusions from them. I might point out incidentally here that uh, my father had published a paper in which he showed that the uh, potentials in the atmosphere, I won't try to explain that now, but at any rate, uh, voltages in the upper, upper atmosphere uh, varied uh, in part according to universal time. In other words, if you plotted everything as to what time it was in Greenwich, can, where the, the center meridian is for the astronomers and the timekeepers, that the curves looked identical even though you were plotting data from different parts of the world. Nobody exactly knew why that was, but it was an interesting fact which my father discovered. So I had already uh, had an interest in this and wondered what to do next in that field if one ever did. Now an interesting thing happened here, at least it seems to me it was interesting, because here's where the teaching of physics interacted with my scientific career in uh, geophysics. In the process of trying to figure out what I should teach and how I should teach it and so on, I went to the Columbia University's set of standardized tests where Ben Wood had uh, been active in developing such things. And I discovered that to use these tests to measure how well my students were getting along compared to the whole nation's set of students, I had to learn some statistics. The, they described these tests and the way they put the questions together and uh, selected which ones were the best in terms of validity and uh, reliability and so forth. And I said, well, what do they mean? I mean, after all, a test's a test. People just make them up. And that isn't so. Uh, what they now call standardized tests for all kinds of purposes are very carefully constructed. And this is what I learned after I got a PhD. <clears throat> Before I got a PhD, I had to study statistics, but a different kind. The kind I studied then were things about how molecules bounce around in gases and how Maxwell and others had shown that this produced the average pressure varying with temperature and all that. All of these things which were called uh, the statistics of gases was a kind of statistics. But here was an entirely new kind. Some people call it psychometrics, but it was a form of trying to measure uh, attributes on testing human beings, and they used statistics in a way that I hadn't heard of before. So I began studying that, and uh, to make a long story short, I got so interested in that that in a year or two, I was going up to all of the statistics meetings 
and I was going to see Professor Hotelling, who was then at Columbia University, and asking him, what do you do about this and what do you do about that? And I found, well, maybe one of the ways to uh, get uh, uh, really up to date on what's happening in statistics was to read a journal called Econometrica. Econometrica, well, that was an effort by economists to do something using statistics to measure things which were quite outside the field of physics. But I started reading that and I found out that there were just a host of people in statistics who were doing things which in general were described as mathematical statistics. And so I got into that. One of the results of all this was that uh, when I changed my orientation and what kind of uh, research I was trying to do at Ursinus College, I began going to the uh, Department of Terrestrial Magnetism down in Chevy Chase, Maryland, Rock Creek Park, and getting loans from them of data which had to do with atmospheric electricity and weather and all kinds of things, uh, and then putting my statistical knowledge to work on this. It was my belief, my uh, measure of what I saw was that uh, the people in these fields were not using the statistics which they could very well profit by if they only knew. And so I wrote some papers, published them to the American Geophysical Union, uh, presented them to them in the uh, Congress in Washington in 1939, one of which was how to apply some of this new statistical technique to uh, such problems as does the sun have any influence on our weather? And another one was about the worldwide variations in these uh, voltages in the upper atmosphere from year to year this measured in various times of year various years seemed to have a certain uh, togetherness uh, whereas my father had been working on the idea that just from day to day the 24-hour variations uh, went together with universal time here was a, something that was almost similar but in a very much longer time scale that a station in Paris and a station in the United States and a station in Australia for instance would show ups and downs on a yearly average which seemed to be somewhat similar well those papers which got published then uh, were my first venture you might say into the world of statistics in a real way. Now perhaps I should explain why I got interested in the sun. That is why I'm saying that the, we ought to investigate and it might be helpful to have statistics to investigate solar relationships on weather. Well, I have a sort of a stubborn streak in me maybe. Uh, some people call it champion of the undo underdog that uh, if other people say this can't be so, there's a sort of a challenge to say why can't it be so? Now let's see, let's examine that further. It turned out that all of my colleagues, my father's colleagues really, but with whom I was meeting and working then after my father had died in 28, uh, why here I was in the 1930s uh, working for a while at this terrestrial magnetism, or terramag as some people call it. And when I saw that the atmospheric electricity variations that I was uh, examining seemed to vary with something on the sun, why I was told that there was no good working on that. That would lead nowhere because of course the atmospheric electricity was purely something which was affected all the time by the wind and the dust and all sorts of meteorology and had nothing to do with the sun. And I said, well, how do we know, you know? Well, if you keep on that way, you're going to be as crazy uh, as that fellow Abbott. I might explain that uh, Charles Greeley Abbott 
was for years secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, and he spent most of his life, it seems, trying to take observations of the radiation that came from the sun and was received at the Earth, and he claimed that he could measure variations in this radiation so that although it was called a solar constant, that the solar constant wasn't really constant and the variations in it affected the weather. The Weather Bureau had nothing to do with this. They would not listen for a moment to that idea. And here I was being told I would be classed with this man who was then, as I say, considered a sort of a nut by many people. Oh, he was a legitimate scientist who worked hard and who was later given proper recognition on his 101st year of life. I met him just before he died, but uh, at a meeting which was dedicated to him. But the uh, idea then was he didn't know any statistics, and therefore you couldn't trust anything he tried to prove. So I thought, well, that I can remedy. I know some statistics now. I feel that I've got the tools necessary to help. And so what I did was to set off to find out what I could do to show that the sun did affect the weather. Well, that's a long story which uh, got me into a lot of things, but because of the, uh, tr the attitude of the weatherman that I knew at that time, and I knew the chief forecasters, Mr. Mitchell and others down at the Weather Bureau, because of those people and the attitude I knew they had and the general attitude I found by attending meteorological meetings, uh, I was pretty sure that if I had any results that bore on this subject, I would better present them to the uh, Physical Society. And in 1939 or so, I uh, had some of those results, and I presented them right at the University of Pennsylvania in the hall next to what right, was next to the Moore School because uh, it was the teacher's college in the corner there. and. Uh, I came down to a AAAS meeting on physical section and gave a paper which showed that there seemed to be evidence for the rainfall of the United States to uh, have a kind of periodicity which varied with the rotation of the sun, or which showed the relationship of the sun's rotation to the amount of rainfall we got. This was analyzing daily rainfall from all the weather maps over the world. Well, I was able to do that, incidentally, by putting a dozen or so students at work out at Ursinus, uh, adding up all the numbers of daily rainfall or precipitation uh, on the weather maps. The weather maps, well, I borrowed them from my laboratory, um, from a library, rather, down at uh, Magnetism. They had no use for weather, so just the fact that they got these maps, uh, the librarian kept them, but uh, except for looking at the day's forecast, they never paid any attention to them further, you know. Uh, so I borrowed these and had the students that are sinus working on them. And the net result of that, from the point of view of little research work, was that we analyzed a more or less uh, persistent, but not totally persistent, wave which seemed to have a period of about the same period of the rotation of the sun. Well, I thought that would help prove something, but it didn't prove much to anybody if they were even listening. Uh, those who were meteorologists commented, well, that could happen dozens of ways. Maybe the atmosphere has a resonance which uh, accounts for that. Who knows? It certainly doesn't prove that the sun has got anything to do with it. Well, little did they know, of course, of all the things that I knew about, but I couldn't stop and explain that all to everybody. And I was working part of the time in those days, when I wasn't teaching at Ursinus, with a man named Julius Bartles, who, with another man named Sidney Chapman, wrote several volumes, with classic volumes now, on geomagnetism and uh, uh, how you analyze periods both in the tides of the air as well as in magnetism. And that was one of the methods which they used for 
proving that the sun had something to do with the magnetism, namely trying to analyze things which were almost periodic, things that would almost come back every time the sun came back because the sun had spots on it which sometimes would disappear and sometimes would appear. But as the sun rotated, you might sometimes get the same thing happening 27 or so days after another one. The only people that were interested in that kind of behavior from the sun at that time were the people interested in radio communication. Even the military were beginning to be interested in that. Radio was coming to be of interest for communication all around the world. And so the Bureau of Standards had a department of radio whose uh, function in part was to understand what the sun had to do with the communication. And uh, so I got working with various groups and uh, in that way thought that I had another career cut out for me, you might say. Uh, to what extent are the sunspots influencing the radio? To what extent are they influencing the weather? And so on. And uh, this uh, only brought, drew me into computation to the extent that the more and more I did of this, the more I saw the necessity for something which was going to be uh, helpful in speeding up the statistical analysis. It's all very well to uh, make a, uh, a mathematical result, you might say, in uh, statistics which says that if you have certain kinds of readings, why then that'll prove something. But first you have to get those readings. You have to derive some data somewhere. And from that data you have to produce results which are in a statistical sense, a way of applying the laws of probability to say, how likely is it that what you've just found is just an accident, like rolling the dice? What kind of an accident is it, for instance, if you toss a coin and you get heads 92 times out of 100? Well, nobody can say. It could be absolutely just a freak accident of that time. And if you do it again, maybe you get tails and whatnot. But if you continue to do this and you always get, say, 92% of the tosses come out heads, then you can apply some kind of a reasoning to this to say, this is very, very fishy. It couldn't happen that way just by chance. There must be a reason. That coin must be biased. It, something acting here that is more than just chance. And so you can do that kind of thing with statistics as it applies to weather observations and solar observations and so on. And that's what I was heading toward then. But to do that, I had to compute. So I could have lots of students working for me. And I just did have about a dozen. And with some of them, I gave them a little adding machine that bought second hand as well as another computer that I'd bought before, and we tried to get these um, data reduced and applied to problems like this. But over and over again, I keep kept thinking about the places where I was taking some of my physics students to look at what was going on in physics labs all over the country in the way of research. Now, some of those friends of mine who had gotten PhDs at Hopkins were back at Trusted Magnetism uh, investigating whether the atom itself might be the source of the Earth's magnetism. So they'd built a big high voltage generator and they were accelerating particles. They were shooting things at other pieces of matter in a manner which is very common nowadays, of course, in all kinds of nuclear physics laboratories. But in those days, nuclear physics was not very far along. These same fellows who I knew, Hafstead and Tuve and Gregory Bright, had in that laboratory at the beginning, just before the 
war, repeated the experiment which they'd heard about from Germany, where a girl named Lisa Meitner had shown that the atom divided fission of the atom and released energy. This was the beginning of the atom bomb. But how did they do this? With what tools were they working? Well, one of the important tools that I was interested in was that they had what they called uh, scaling circuits. These are devices which would measure pulses of an atom going through a gas and electrifying it. And those pulses, each one would indicate that one more atom had been split off and somehow some effect had been created. And sometimes these things happen very fast and they'd have to, to get enough experimental data, they had to run things so that uh, maybe they were counting a thousand or 10,000 times per second. There weren't any mechanical counters that counted that fast. A thousand was about the limit, and even that might not be reliable. So they had electron tubes wired up in such a way that they could take counts that came almost as fast as a million per second and subdivide this so that every time they got a certain number of counts, there would be one pulse put out.